vision of the botanist gin is really about distilling isla. The 22 wild isla botanicals are the botanist's connection to isla. You're going to get the citrus, you're going to get the juniper, but you're also going to get that lovely herbal aspect from the Isle of Botanicals. It's all done by hand, by eye, by nose. It's a working process that people put their hearts and souls into. Um, it's amazing that we can uh, come back together. It was a nice vibe last night at Boca as well. We're all standing around the bar. Finally, we can do that. Really, really cool. Um, really quickly, just want to tell you how Boca fits into all of this, um, how the story came together with the botanist and with obviously the team from Little Red Door. But thank you so much, Brent. Thanks for the past school. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you, guys. Timothy and Alex, great to have you guys. For some of you who um, do not know Boca, we're a homegrown concept. We're situated in DIFC. We're wall to wall with Zuma, and then across the road is Cipriani, and then everyone else. Um, we're a homegrown concept, so back in 2014, we wanted to create something from the ground up, something that we can, hold, that we can call uh, truly homegrown. Um, it was modern European in, in its execution because we believed that allowed us that platform for creativity. A big part of that, because we were homegrown, we wanted to dedicate um, a good portion of our menu to local ingredients. Now, what does that mean? To a lot of people, when we tell that to a lot of people outside, they say, you live in the desert, what does that really mean? Well, we must not forget that we've got over 1,400 kilometers of coastline overlooking two oceans, Arabian Gulf and the Indian Ocean. Plenty of fish and seafood uh, that we can work with. Now, something that is uncommon here, but common everywhere else, that at the fish market, the vegetable market, the first people that you see in the morning are chefs, mixologists, bartenders. That's not common over here. And I think it's rooted in old school accounting systems. So from day one, I made it a point to trust my guys with cash in hand to go down to the fish market and buy certain variety that maybe not a lot of people are working with. Everyone's used to looking at Hamour and Sultan Ibrahim, but there are a lot of other variety. The challenge was that they would come back with a scribbled note for a receipt. When we give it to the accountant, it's like, where's the credit note? Where's the credit facility? Where's the VAT right now? But we said, you know what? We need to do this because it's in the heart of our concept. So it started with fish and seafood, but then it uh, evolved into the, um, the vegetables and fruits. As we developed, as the country developed and realized that food security is an important topic, new farms started sprouting up. So we started connecting with these guys. And these guys are you know, organic, hydroponic, aquaponic farms, traditional farming. There's a lot of change that's happening over there. So as we went through the years, the portion of local ingredients increased in our menu. But we still thought about what, it is, what is really native to our country? What is, what is really from here? What is an endemic variety that, that, we, can, that we can find out? So we started exploring, um, and we were curious. Uh, we connected with a center called the International Center for Biocene and Agriculture, and these guys are scientists. Their role was to map out every single botanic in the country and in the region, what is really native, because they were assigned to look for certain species that could provide high protein content, nutritious plants that can grow in harsh conditions like the desert, in high saline water, in, in, arid, in arid lands. So these guys have mapped it out. But that was an, in, like a huge book. That was thousands of species. Most of it was not edible. But then throughout our conversations with the farmers, and the farmers have quite a network, they connected us to um, a person that is in between, if you look at a triangle between Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Al Ain, it's the middle of nowhere, really. And he was going around the country, foraging for native species and putting them all together in his nursery. I grew up here, and I remember that after it rains in the desert, uh, my father and I we used to go and pick certain types of mallow, things that in, in local dialect are called khubbez and humed. So I was really curious, because I knew that certain things are native to this country. So through this guy, we were able to identify certain species that in season you can find them in the market, but then there were, there were things that people used to consume in the past, way before oil, way before abundance. Um, and we boiled it down to four species. Um, there was uh, the two types of mallow, homemade and khubbez, and then there was a succulent, an extremely bitter succulent, a cactus-looking one, um, that used to, people used to uh, boil it into a stew and consume it with rice in the past. But we realized in the kitchen that 
actually, if you pickle it, then it, it will mellow down that bitterness, then we can use it in the food. There was a shrub um, called sheikh that is extremely aromatic, uh, reminds us almost of thyme. And that was incredible to use in infusions of oil. So that's something that we, that we did there in the kitchen. There are obviously a lot of things that are, that are found in the market, things like black lime, things like, um, as you guys know, like hibiscus is found in abundance, so there's a lot of ingredients um, that are really specific to this area, this region. So obviously that's something that we've been doing, and, and it's reached certain level of fruition last year with our menus, and obviously that's been spilling over into, into the bar, and that's when Rebecca said, listen, this is our message. The botanist is all about that, is about, all about these foraged ingredients. We know these guys that are, that are doing incredible work on um, having the ingredient lead the cocktail. Why don't we bring, come together and, and, and put something? And that's when we connected. Um, this was a couple of months ago, and it was, a, it was an immediate, the synergy is there. Uh, so we said, why don't, why don't we have you guys over? Uh, we'll show you some of our favorite farms. We'll show you some of these native ingredients, and we'll put a menu together that is led by these ingredients. Um, so we, uh, we went on that trip, it was an incredible trip. We're hopefully getting a, a really nice documentary out of that. And last night was our, our first lunch. Um, yeah, and, and uh, that's it for me. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you guys about a lot of these ingredients that we're using, obviously a lot of other stuff that we're doing behind the bar and in, in, in the kitchen, around waste and around uh, sustainability in general. But I'll leave it to uh, Alex right now to talk to you about Little Red Door. Thank you, guys. Thank you for Rebecca and Omar for bringing us over. Um, I want to start off by saying that um, because of all the things I'll, I'll go into um, in the next half an hour to 45 minutes, I'll try and be as succinct as possible. That I could literally speak for days about all of this and have done regularly. Um, but it's very hard to do all of this and then travel internationally working with brands and other venues because this isn't marketing. This is the aspect of mine and Tim's and the rest of the team at Little Red Door's lives. It's the thing that we get up for. It's what we really care about. And most people in this room will understand often when you work with brands and when you get invited to do guest shifts, there's a lot of compromise involved. Um, for us, someone like the botanist being one of, I think, two of the spirit brands in the world that has B Corp certification, uh, which I think Rebecca might speak a little bit about like what that means, but basically it means that you are going above and beyond your business practices to be responsible in terms of staffing, sourcing, packaging, logistics, and everything else. And to work with a restaurant that shares the same values in terms of working farm to table, in terms of being a champion for producers and produce, isn't that often. We often have to spend a lot of time explaining to brands and to venues who we visit why we work the way we do and what that really means because most people think it, you know, it's a nice marketing video and then when we get there, you know, we're happy to just pour whatever. Um, but that's very much not the case. So thank you so much for, for putting this together and giving us the opportunity to do it in such a holistic way. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about kind of roughly, it can be described as ecosystems. So it's looking at how to implement a farm to table model that in restaurants, there's probably been about 10 years now of the farm to table movement. It's fairly commonplace. Um, most chefs kind of worth their salt nowadays will be on where they're getting their produce from, how are they working in sustainable practices, knowing uh, what they're gonna put on the plate and working seasonally. But that hasn't really translated into bars. Um, I think it's slightly understandable why it hasn't translated into bars and that's some of the dynamics we'll go into, but there isn't really a very good reason if you actually get into it why bars couldn't work in that way. So when I say farm to table, we're talking about working directly with producers. Obviously, for anybody who doesn't know, Little Red Door is based in Le Marais in Paris, uh, which roughly, well, literally translates as the swamp, but it's much more glamorous than it sounds. Um, working farm to table is about cultivating long-term relationships with producers. It goes beyond just placing orders with your fresh produce distributor. 
And for us, I think most people who work farm to table, it's about putting the producer on the plate in the case of restaurants, or in our case, putting the producer at the front of our guest experience. There are like eight menus dotted around the room. Please pass them around for anybody who hasn't had a chance to see them, but you'll see that pretty much all of the drink is just a photo of the producer and the name of the produce. There is very little else going on there. And to be honest with you, the drinks themselves don't get that much more complicated than that. We spend most of our time finding how do we take this produce, how do we put it into the glass, and then that's most of the work done. Um, some of you might think, why work farm to table? What is the benefits other than it sounding quite nice and being some fun sometimes? You know, no one, not many people don't like visiting a farm. But um, specifically in, from the point of view of France, but a lot of the issues that farmers in France face, the same issues you face all over the world. Obviously, Dubai is a little bit different, but greenhouse gas emissions, soil erosion, water scarcity, agrochemical pollution, wildlife loss, and displacement are some of the small issues that are caused by modern agricultural farming. Most agricultural farming nowadays is monocultures. They are made in large warehouse. They are produced not too dissimilarly to electronics. They have very little concern for the environments they're placed in, and they ultimately are only focused on profit. Um, there is a lot to be said for creating affordable food, especially in areas of the world like Africa, Southeast Asia. Affordability is important, but there is a cost to that. And we're starting to see the ecological effects of creating monoculture farming all over the world. And if you want to see the biggest example of like the long-term effects of monoculture, you look at the Sahara Desert. Poor quality agricultural practices resulted in the Sahara Desert. It is not naturally forming. It's the same as a lot of the deserts in America. These come about from destructive, extractive agricultural pro processes. But what does this all mean for a bar? So um, the menu itself is called Grounded. This was our first step into producing a menu based around farm to table uh, practices. Um, this is very different from how Little Red Door has operated historically. So Little Red Door will have been open 10 years in October. Uh, of those 10 years, we have been in the 50 best bars eight times. Um, and most of that has been led by our conceptual menus. So it's what we became most well known for. We've done menus on architecture, on different forms of art, on universal values, uh, on flavor and sensation, all sorts. Uh, and actually, the menu before this one came out on March 16th, I think it was. And on March 18th was when Paris went into its first lockdown for COVID. So we had two days of our menu, and then boom. And we were sat there in the menus at Little Red Door take about nine months to make, give or take. Uh, and so you kind of start straight away. The moment a menu launches, you go straight into what do we do next? And when we had COVID lockdowns and all of that, we had nothing but time. So we sat there and said, what do we want to do? And through a variety of different ideas, uh, we came to the conclusion that we wanted to do everything. We, did, we had all of the time to properly plan and implement something that we would be proud of, and so Grounded came from that. But I always explain it a little bit, like pulling the thread on a jumper. You know, I would be lying in saying that if when we started to make this menu, we thought we'd be anywhere near where we are now. We just every single time kept saying, well, what if we did this, and why don't we do that? And if we did that, we need to do this, and then Next thing you know, the business has changed basically from the ground up. Uh, the day-to-day -day workflow of every single staff member in the bar and the company has changed. Uh, my, my role as could not have changed more dramatically. The way we go about planning menus has completely changed. Uh, and we think, personally, for the better. And the feedback we've had has been really amazing. And so that's kind of what I'm going to go through is, what those changes look like, and some of the things you guys can maybe take away from that that might help you guys better understand how to implement parts of this. Because I will caveat all of this, well, this is a little video about it, but I'll caveat all of this with some points afterwards about where we came from and what allow us to work in this way. Because we understand that 
for a variety of different reasons. It isn't possible to do all of this, but in the same way that we aren't able to implement the systems that someone like Blue Hill Farms in New York State are able to have a huge farm creating everything you could possibly imagine for them every single day, we don't have the ability to do that. We're in central Paris. So we have limitations. You guys here in a desert have very different limitations. However, those things are changing, and it's some of the stuff we've experienced with Omar's help of showing us around Dubai that there's innovation everywhere, and you, you just have to be a little bit more imaginative. But a large part of what this menu was produced by was us traveling around France, visiting these producers, getting to know all of these, and there's a little video here about what that looked like. So what you just saw was a small little montage of all the different producers we went out and visited. Um, like I mentioned, most of this was done during the first and the second lockdown for COVID. So we had nothing but time. And we had the nice excuse of being able to drive around all of France saying it was for work, which was pretty fun. Um, but like I mentioned, all of this is built on a platform. So of the last nine years, Little Red Door has gone from being a relatively acquired speakeasy in, uh, in Paris to one of the busiest bars I've ever worked in or seen. Um, the bar itself is probably not that much bigger than this room. Um, we are at capacity every single night, pretty much. 95% um, of our drink sales are cocktails. 95% of those cocktails are the ones in this menu. Um, I would say one person a night at most ends up in Little Red Door unintentionally. We do not have many people arriving in Little Red Door who don't know where they are or why they are there because there's a half an hour queue. And so no one just stands in line half an hour for a beer, right? Um, that give, puts in a very special position because guests go in knowing that they want to try something different, something uh, they want to be challenged, they want to be taken on an experience, and that allows us to work in the way that we do. Um, and what we decided to do, and what, what my experience compared to a place like London, where that definitely wasn't the case for most of the bars I worked in, was to use that to actually uh, be more demanding of ourselves, of how we work and, and who we work with. And that was one of the things we saw when, during the first COVID lockdown, we saw the effects that us closing as a business had on our ecosystem or our supply chain. We saw how small to medium-sized brands struggled in the same way we did. They had cash flow issues, they had staffing issues, they, they were hit hard in a very different way to the way you see the larger, more international brands were hit. In the same way, the producers, you know, the fresh produce work, uh, suppliers we were working with, not only were they hit, but the farms they were hit, working with were hit in the same way and we decided that you know Little Red Door is one hell of a vehicle for change. We are, have million euro turnovers every single year. We do hundreds of cocktails every night. If we make a small change in the bar it has a big impact to everyone further down the line and so we thought well what if we made all of those decisions be the benefits for the people we care about most. Um, so the aim of the way we wanted to change the business model, and this is kind of the most businessy part of the whole presentation, is if you wanted to describe it very technically, it is seasonal vertical integration. Seasonal vertical integration means moving to a model where we only uh, purchase during peak season, so we only buy produce at the height of their season for two reasons. One, because it's the most economical, and two, it's the most effective for acquiring flavor. If you buy produce outside of its season, it will cost you more and it will not taste as good. So it makes no sense. The other side is vertical integration. Vertical integration means that we purchase uh, the means to produce ourselves. Rather than being reliant completely on brands to supply all of the raw materials that we work with, we produce, at the moment, I'd say 50 to 60% of the liquid we sell we produce ourselves. The long-term ambition is that 90% we will produce ourselves and the other 10% will make, be made collaborative with us. The reason why we want to do that is twofold. One is margin. We use this to create a bit better margin on our drinks 
that better margin goes to paying for all of the other costs that you'll see as we go through. Um, we basically decided that instead of relying on brands to innovate for us, we wanted to innovate for ourselves and we wanted to invest back in ourselves. Instead of purchasing an amazing French liqueur, we would make it ourselves and we would use the additional margin to invest in producing liqueurs ourselves, whether that be in rotovaps, centrifuges, stills, aging warehouses, more staff, you name it. Each year is a inve continued investment in ourselves so that we can grow to be more innovative in the future. Um, however, all of this cost, all of this has a lot of cost. All of it builds up. Like I said, it's kind of like you start pulling at the string going, oh, that's a nice idea, that's a nice idea, and then you see the bills at the end of the month, and you go, oh, shit, okay, we need to make money from this. So the idea is offsetting. Additional labor costs and rent costs offset by additional margin. And this continued investment means that not only are we able to keep being efficient and keep generating enough of a profit margin to pay for this, but year on year, we will be able to keep innovating and we'll be able to keep investing in ourselves. Um, as a bar, we're very close to our guests. One of the amazing things of people like Botanist is they can innovate on a scale that we simply can't for a variety of reasons. However, one of the issues for someone like Botanist is they aren't able to continuously bring out new products. Logistically, branding-wise, it doesn't really make sense. However, as Little Red Door, we are so close to our, our uh, consumer that if we produce 200 liters of a gin, we can get rid of that in three months. We sell enough cocktails. If we just offset it into one drink, it's gone. That means of being closer to our guests allow us to be more innovative and more responsive to the needs of our guests, which is something I think we go into. So this has a load of challenges associated with it, right? Um, continue investing in ourselves, well, there's going to be compromises. We put quite strict rules on how we work. If we work locally with French producers, the first thing that most people ask us when we tell them about this is, yeah, but how do you make a margarita? Like, where do you get tequila from? Where do you get limes from? Well, we don't have limes. There aren't many limes in Europe, and most of them aren't really the kind of limes people want in a margarita. So we don't have those. So there are compromises in places. Sourcing, where do you find your citrus? There aren't that many citrus farms that grow on a scale that can supply for a bar in France. Um, storage, where the hell do you store the four, five, six hundred liters of liqueur you're going to make in peak season? Where are you going to store the two tons of red kiwi that arrive with one day notice? Uh, and who is going to process all of that red kiwi when it arrives with one day notice? It's not simple. And if we didn't have the combined 12 months of lockdown through COVID to figure it out, we probably wouldn't have been able to do it. However, now we have, we're hoping we can show people further down the line about how you guys can learn a little bit from that. And maybe one day we'll see more and more and more venues working in this way. So the first and foremost, when you're talking about your bar program is the guest experience. Like what does the guest see? How do they interact with all of that hard work you're doing? Because if they aren't interacting with that in an engaging and interesting way, then all of it doesn't matter. You can be the smartest person in every single room, but if you aren't able to convey that to your guests, it doesn't really mean anything. So we find that the parameters of working in this way, trying to work locally, trying to work seasonally, trying to work directly with producers, forces us to be innovative by its nature. When you aren't able to source lime, fruit, lime juice all year round, that forces you to find creative solutions to find alternatives. When you have to find flavor profiles of exotic fruit that just so simply exist in Europe, you're forcing yourself to find innovative alternatives that exist in your ecosystem. Um, it also forces you to work with more and more people. And the more and more people you work with, especially if you work in this model, you end up with all of these different relationships that feed into themselves. So the model we have with our um, producers is they now, after about a year and a half of working with them, are now coming to us with innovations. They come to us with things that don't exist. So instead of us going out and looking for things, we have producers saying, hey, I've just heard about this really interesting form of ginger or this weird, interesting variety of melon. We want to give it a go. Would you guys like to buy it? And so now we're having things that simply didn't exist within our ecosystems before because our producers see 
they have the means to sell that to someone now and we have the means to act on that. Um, one thing I think a lot of people worry about with stuff like this is that the creative freedom. How can you create the diversity of flavor and offering for your guests within that system if you're only using French products, right? How can you give those exotic flavors? How can you create those uh, classic cocktails that everyone looks for? And so I'm like massively led by numbers. Most of my job is spreadsheets. Um, so I was a little bit skeptical. So I looked at our numbers. Little Red Door, like I said, has been open for nearly 10 years. We have nearly 10 years worth of numbers on the drinks we've sold over that period of time. In the last two years, like I mentioned, 95, this is actually, with the new menu, it's actually gone up to 95. But in the last two years, only one classic cocktail has sold more than 1,000 times. Does anyone want to guess? Well, not a Negroni. Old fashioned. But remember, this is 10 years. Old fashions have been the one for 10 years. Negronis are only just becoming the one, right? So compared to creations, we're nearly 5,000. And creation is basically a button we have on the till. When someone doesn't see what they want on the menu, they can't think of a classic cocktail, they say, make me something that tastes like this. What that said to us is that we spend more time either selling the drinks on our menu or using our own creativity for our guests than anywhere near the amount of time we spend on classics. However, if you look at most back bars in bars, a significant portion of the bottles on the back bar there will be there because people think they should have those things just in case someone comes in and orders that classic cocktail, that version of a Vucare. Um, and so we wanted to shift away from that. We felt like it wasn't really gonna cost our guests experience and it hasn't in any way Moving away from using lime juice, we have not had a single margarita sent back because we don't use fresh lime juice. We haven't had uh, anybody turn around and say, oh, I don't like my old fashioned because you guys don't use citrus peel on it. You know, the, there has been very little kickback in that way. Like I said, it does help being a bar where people come for specifically the creativity we bring to it. Um, and the benefits of moving away from that have allowed us to be completely uh, transparent in all of the products that we use. We work with an Alsatian distiller, so the east of France. We work with a distiller who makes our neutral grain from French grain. We're working with them now to source uh, organic barley from France to make the neutral grain we have. We work with organic uh, beet sugars from France. That means all of the liqueurs, all of the spirits we have because we work directly with the farms and because we know exactly where all of the spirits, that we, the base alcohol we're using comes from, we can tell you pretty much every single drop of liquid in your glass, where it came from, where the money you spent, who that's going to support. Um, obviously that gets a little bit more complicated when we bring brands into it, but that's what we're working towards now is making sure we can do that with every single brand we work with is we can tell our guests where everything comes from. And it's where that long-term ambition of being able to make 90% of what we sell comes from. Also, and maybe most importantly, because we create all of these things ourselves, the experience in Little Red Door is completely unique. You cannot have that experience anywhere else because everything is made by us. The, ignoring the fact that before all of the creativity and everything else, Little Red Door became well known for being a kind of a safe haven of hospitality in Paris. It was the place where you could hide away from the scary French waiters who wouldn't talk to you, and you could have that international style of service, uh, which we still have present and is still a fundamental part of the guest experience at Little Red Door. But all of these building blocks that we're making that are completely built on French producers and innovative forms of production make our experience completely unique to us. Uh, one of those, for example, a really good example of, of what's completely unique to us, this is Etienne. He's a citrus producer we work with. He's based in the Pyrenees in the southwest of France. When we went down and visited him, he was one of the most protective. He was one of the most difficult farmers to get on board. He only really works with two and three Michelin star chefs around uh, France. He's a bioconservationist by trade, so he spent most of his life on New Caledonia um, working on uh, bioconservation. When he moved to the Pyrenees to take over Bashus, which was a kind of legendary citrus farm, which was, was basically created to give citrus to the French two and three Michelin star chefs. 
we emailed Tim, rang everybody, emailed away saying, we want to work with you, can we do this? And he said, yeah, yeah, cool, if you want to do that, come down. You know, Not really expecting a group of bartenders from Paris to jump on the four hour train and come all the way down to the Pyrenees. And we showed up and he was a little bit like, oh, okay, cool. And he showed them around and he was walking through the, the tunnels where they grow all of their citrus and all of their, their greenhouses. And uh, there was one grotesquely large citrus in one of the tunnels just on the ground. And he kind of kicked it away and was like, I was really annoyed, didn't want to talk about it. And we're like, what is that? And he's like, nah, it's rubbish, don't worry about it. And he said, no, no, no it's like, tell us. And he said, well, it was a hybrid. Because he works in bioconservation, he makes lots of hybrids to try and create strains of citrus that are more adapted to the modern environment uh, to basically preserve uh, the genealogy of certain plants. And this one he'd made was a form of pomelo. But it was huge, and it was mainly pith, and it was unbelievably bitter. And he made it thinking that it would be a really interesting uh, product for Michelin star chefs for use for desserts. Um, but everybody he sent it to said, no way am I using that. That's unbelievably bitter. We cannot possibly put that on someone's plate. Which for a chef is a problem, you know? You have to spend a lot of work removing bitterness. But for a bar, half the things we use are bitter. And so we make one of the ingredients, if you look in the menu, the citrus drink, the citrus bitter is based off of what he calls pomelo, which is basically, it's a, it's a pomelo that looks like a giant pear. Um, that citrus only exists in Etienne's farm. No one else buys it from Etienne because we're the only bar Etienne works with and all of the chefs don't want to use it. You can only taste that experience of bitter in Little Red Door. Um, and this, that story is also a really great example of what you get by working directly. But when I say directly, I mean going to the farm. If we'd emailed Etienne and he said, yeah, cool, we'll sell you citrus, we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't gone there and seen it and spent time with him getting to know what they do and how they work. And that story is kind of replicated in every single product that we have on this menu, on the next menu that will come out in May, the one after that that will come out next February, is a series of those conversations about what do you have, what can you do, what can we do together that's unique and interesting and can highlight some of the amazing French, pro French produce that we have. Um, other kind of farms we work with, um, does everyone know what permaculture farming is? No? I'll explain to everyone. Permaculture farming is low input, high labor, labor intensive, bio intensive farming. It is basically traditional farming. It is like organic farming, but on an insanely complicated and very um, intense traditional form of farming. It goes back to traditional forms of farming that create ecosystems that sustain themselves rather than the, all of the work being done by generally machinery. Um, there's a big movement in France and a lot of Northern Europe now towards permaculture farming, specifically because of the effects of climate change. But they're one of our key partners. I'd say there are two people we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. They're Unfirm de Perche and there's another one uh, which is an urban farm in Paris. They are the example of someone who can give us, whereas Etienne produces just citrus, a very specialized farmer, gives us very specific, high quality produce um, that fit our need. These guys basically make everything. They make fruit, vegetables, whatever we need. The dynamic of working with them is um, interesting because you can't just place one order from a permaculture farm. For example, we spent most of the first year of working with these farms just buying the stuff they couldn't sell. So you've got to remember when you're a farm, you don't plan day to day, week to week, or even month to month. You plan in five year cycles, especially if you're a permaculture farm, you basically have a 10 year plan of what you're going to plant in every single part of your farm. Because if you don't have a 10 year plan, you aren't building up the ecosystem you need for long term growth. What that means is if I send an email and say, Tom, who, when you, if you guys look on the, it's the beetroot cocktail in the menu. If you look at Tom, who's a suspiciously young man for a farmer, if you say to him, I want ginger, he'll say, great, you can have 20 kilograms of ginger next year. However, to buy 20 kilograms of ginger, I have to buy 50 kilograms of melon, five kilograms of spinach, and a variety of other things that they have to grow either before and after ginger, 
to counteract the extractive qualities of ginger as a crop, or they have to grow it around ginger so that ginger will grow in an optimum way that is in keeping with their form of producing. Now, some of those things, you know, they're really simple. Yeah, cool, we'll take melons. Melons are really easy thing to put in drinks. Great, we can take strawberries. Spinach, a little less obvious. And this is where I'm talking about innovation. If all of a sudden you know you have to do something with 20 kilograms of spinach for a drink, you have to get creative. And from those challenges is a lot of the interesting ingredients we have here. Beetroot is a really good example of that. Um, the beetroot with mistel we make for the menu uh, is basically using traditional French forms of making fortified wines, but instead of using grapes, we use another high sugar uh, crop, which is beets. We actually use yellow beets and red beets. We weren't able to buy one variety of beets. We had to buy three different variety of beets to be able to qualify for the way that Tom works. And that create, causes to create probably one of our most well-known products now, and something we will keep making it all year round. Um, what's great though is because in the first year we were buying so much from them just to support them, you know, these guys when they're planning five years, they don't plan for two years of closures for pandemics. They didn't plan that all of a sudden no restaurants in Paris are going to be open for nearly a whole year. So they ended up with loads of produce and this is somewhere where we can work very differently from restaurants is restaurants are very good at taking large amounts of produce because they literally put that onto the plate, right? Bars, we don't have that luxury. We can't literally put things onto the plate and the amount of produce we need to do that is often a lot smaller. However, what we can do is we don't have to work in a very time sensitive way because a lot of what we do is converting things into alcohol. Most of the alcohols we use are shelf stable. So these things will last for six months to two years to indefinitely in the case of spirits. So we can buy a whole crop from someone in one year. We can infuse it, we can fortify it, we can ferment it, we can do whatever. And then we can sit on that. And that's basically what we did. So for the urban farm we work with, we bought an ungodly amount of tomatoes from them. I have a huge storage space in the very edge of Paris right now, full of these tomatoes, because they couldn't sell them. No one was opening. In Paris, most of the restaurants that they would sell to just weren't interested in reopening because Paris without tourism just isn't worth it. And they were really stuck. And they sat down with us at the end of last summer and they basically said, okay, tell us what you want this year because you guys saved us last year. And now we're building relationships where people understand that we can help them. They understand how they can help us. What's great is because of the nature of our, our farmers don't really know what restaurants want. They just kind of guess. They have even less of an idea of what a bar would want. So they're more led by us now. But the amount, the opportunities they have for growing are much bigger when they work with a lot of different clientele. Um, so like I mentioned, I have, we have a, a storage space. Um, no bar in the world is designed to receive tons, I mean literally tons of fresh produce. Um, I remember the first day we got our first big fresh produce delivery of strawberries, it was about 500 kilograms. It was just sat in the middle of the bar and we had no idea where it was going to go, how we were going to deal with it. Every single fridge space we had was full of sous vide bags crammed of these strawberries. Um, again, luckily this was during COVID, so we had a lot of free time to kind of get through this stuff and we realized very quickly we needed to find a second space. And I don't really know a better word. It's not really a lab because we have a lab below Little Red Door. We have, a, a, in English, you call it like a larder. It's just like a space where you store stuff. Um, and right now, this is a temporary space. It's about half the size of this room. It has a huge freezer. It has a walk-in freezer. It used to be the, the production site for our ice, supply, uh, ice supplier who, who kindly gave it to us when they moved into a much bigger space. Um, we're currently looking for a bigger space because we have to find some way of storing all of these things we're making. Um, but the long-term ambition as well with this is that we won't just be making for the menu, we're going to be building up the back bar and we're going to be building up this portfolio of the things we have. Again, in keeping with this idea of everything you've tried in the red door being very completely unique to us. What we want initially is, okay, right now we have beetroot mistel and tomato eau de vie. Well, next year we want to have a tomato eau de vie that's finished in casks that have contained beetroot mistel. The year after that, we want to have a whiskey that's aged in tomato eau de vie barrels. We want to have white wines that are conditioned in raspberry vermouth casks. We want to build up this portfolio and we want to 
almost that uh, Japanese whiskey approach of creating thousands of inputs to create a million different expressions. We want to keep building and building and building, but the only way we can do that is by building up a store of all of these things and giving us that uh, flexibility. Eventually as well, we probably will end up, yes? Yeah, of course. Um, so um, we will eventually also start looking at selling these um, direct to consumers. It won't be on any kind of scale. We'll never really be interested in becoming a full distillery where we produce a lot of these things purely for commercial use. But the idea in a lot of this came from when we first started this menu process, obviously during the first lockdown, we saw a big movement towards people drinking at home or over the, over the world, people were like buying ready to drink takeaway cocktails. I don't know if that was very big in Dubai. For about a week, it was very big in Paris. And then French people went, no, we don't really, we've got wine, we're okay. Um, we realized that this wasn't necessarily the business model we wanted for a variety of reasons, not least because like I said, all of these things are really great, but so much of the Little Red Door experience is being in the room with our staff in that atmosphere. And so no matter how amazing the drinks are, if you don't have that environment, it's not really Little Red Door. So what we were more interested in doing is giving people the tools to recreate drinks in a similar style to us. So bottling beetroot mistel so that you don't have to make our version of a beetroot cocktail, you can make your version of a beetroot cocktail at home. The idea is eventually we'll have a cav or a wine shop that will start to sell small amounts of these. They'll only ever be done in small productions. They'll only be done in specific vintages per each year. Uh, and each one, in a similar way to uh, botanists and Brookladdy, will have the traceability on the bottle. You'll be able to see exactly where all of these individual inputs that go into this come from. And one of the really exciting things for me as someone who gets to like pull this together is the diversity of roles is growing and growing. So in uh, October last year, we had a team member move from basically being a se senior member of the bar team to being the head of production. They basically are the senior bartender who is in charge of organizing all of our production, our prep, our sourcing. Their, their job, they do now one day of service a, a month. Most likely by the time this next menu is finished in, and comes out in May, there'll be them plus another staff member full time, 12 months of the year, only working on producing products. We're also having to increasingly hire more and more staff who have a more uh, logistic and production background. So instead of hiring bartenders, we're talking about hiring people who have commercial experience, people who have uh, distribution experience, people who've worked in distilleries, who have worked for breweries. Um, that means that the people, the people who make up our team are slowly starting to look dramatically different to your average collection of bartenders. And what's really great as well is that gives more of our team who come in and we only have bartenders, we don't really have bar backs, we have bartender is the lowest level we have. The opportunities for them to progress within the business is growing every single, well, month almost. My role has come out of these changes. There are three new roles within the company that are now at a senior level, which didn't exist before we went through these changes, which now other bartenders have more career paths than just bartender, supervisor, bar manager or brand ambassador. Um, it wasn't really something we planned. None of these things, we didn't sit, I didn't sit down with Tim and say, by the way, Tim, I want a 100 square meter warehouse and five more team members and all of these other things. But what's really amazing is I haven't also ever really had to convince Tim or Daniel, our CEO, or Dotan, the other owner, at any point, oh, this is a good idea because we keep seeing it's a great idea. We see from our guests how much they love the approach farm to table drinking, how much the producers want to work with us. These are people who normally don't pick up the phone for anybody unless you're a three-star Michelin chef are actively reaching out to us. I have farmers sending me messages on Instagram most days now saying, oh, you should come and visit our farm. We do this, we do this. Um, we have more staff members reaching out to us saying they want to come and live and work in Paris specifically to be involved in projects like this. Um, and it basically is driving itself now. We're not really having to convince anybody it's a good idea or how it will work. Um, one last little bit is on travel, because obviously, like I mentioned, there's a, doing this outside of Paris is difficult. We're incredibly best, blessed to be based in Paris and in France. 
And so we're blessed to be in Paris because it is the most visited city in the world. And that, with that, it brings confidence. You know, I'm not too worried that next year, all of a sudden, we will lose all of our guests because if people keep coming to Paris, they'll keep wanting cocktails. And Little Road Door will hopefully always be in that conversation of the best bars to go to in Paris. Um, that gives us long-term stability that allow us to make investments in buying four tons of produce at any given moment, of investing in a still, investing in more staffing. Um, we're incredibly best to be based in France because France has an incredibly diverse agricultural history. Uh, from the north, you have basically what looks like Northern Europe and, and UK, very wet, very soft soil, very fertile. In the south, you have the perfect climate to grow citrus and olives and most kind of hardier Mediterranean veg, and you have everything else in between in the country. We're also incredibly best to be able to buy locally for most of these things. You know, there aren't many countries in the world where you can buy whiskey, brandy, gin, vodka. If you want to get very loose with your classification of local, we even have French, well, French gin, depending on how you feel about Guyana and uh, Haiti, etc. But um, we are very aware that most people aren't in that position. However, we're trying to use this to show you, you know, if, you, if, we can, if we can start to have this conversation about it, everyone else can, you know. Okay, for example, we don't have Pisco in the bar because we have great base distillates from all over France. So why ship it in from Latin America? Yeah, of course, cool. it doesn't taste like Pisco. Most people who drink Pisco sours don't really know what Pisco tastes like they just want a Pisco Sour because they've heard about it, right? The same way most of the people drinking Manhattans don't really drink rye whiskey straight. They just know what a Manhattan feels like. If we can recreate that through other processes, then why not? Um, the only thing we have struggled with is because we have a lot of Americans and they love agave spirits, but that's a different question. Um, actually, one of the ways we overcame that is we carbon, we carbon neutrally imported uh, mezcal for this menu. So the first drink on the menu is made with Kosh mezcal, Kosh put that on a sailboat and sent it over to France in huge four-liter demijohns. We got about 120 liters of that. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end of that supply, so for the very last few months of the menu, we won't actually be able to have that because of how successful this menu was. However, it was an innovative solution that we found to be able to give our guests something that they were looking for. Uh, probably what we'll do ongoing now is looking at if anything we import will be carbon offset. Um, Obviously, there's two sides to that. One, it means our guests know that the, invest, the money they're spending with us, they know that it isn't in any way um, damaging to the environment, but also it incentivizes us to look closer to home because if you're carbon offsetting everything you're importing, you're naturally not going to buy products from Japan or Latin America because it's going to cost you so much more to use it. Or you're going to use it more responsibly, perhaps. When we travel, we try to recreate in the same way we've done with Boca and with Omar. We try to recreate the approach we take in France, but with local produce here. So the version of beetroot that we have here is not the same drink as the drink we do in Paris, because it never will be. Even if we try to recreate it perfectly, they are not the same beetroot. But it doesn't really matter, because the drinks are almost secondary to the ideas. The, the approach and what we're trying to do for most guests is the bit that they care about most. The strawberry drink here is completely different because we don't have many of the products that we have available in France. However, the drink itself here is a unique experience and it's something that we're trying to create more and more when we travel, is make completely unique experiences that it's not about you know that classic thing of you go to a guest shift and you have some okay drinks that probably were better in the bar you went to. Well, all of these drinks, they're not better or worse, they're just different because they can't be the same. And so there's a value to attending a Little Red Door event in Greece because we use Greek olive oil. And Greek olive oil and French olive oil do not taste the same. And so the drink is completely unique to that in the same way that the pure harvest tomatoes and strawberries we've been using here do not taste like the strawberries and tomatoes we source from the Loire Valley or south of Paris. Um, again, it leads us to be more innovative. It allows us to be more creative within what seems like quite a small structure. There's only 10 drinks on that menu, but if you're recreating them over and over again all around the world, you're finding new things about... A good example is olive. When we went to Greece and we recreated the, uh, the olive drink in Greece with the olive oil, we realized that in France, that drink is made with uh, a pot still rum and it's heavy. 
and it's intense and it's like it's incredibly Moorish. But when we did it in Greece, because we did it with a great base distiller and a very light Greek olive oil, it became unbelievably light and floral and delicate and a whole different expression of olive in the same structure. And so the next menu, olive will stay on there. We will keep working with the olive producer, but the drink will be completely different. Even though it may look almost identical, it won't be. And it'll be a different story to talk about olives. Um, I think that's everything. Um, I'm sorry, I probably went over the amount of time I should have, as usual. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything um, about all of that? Change the menu once a year. Um, it would be impossible to change it more regularly than nine months. Probably the long-term ambition is that the menu will change once a year um, at the uh, beginning of spring, because that will give us a whole growing year to build up stock. Um, that's quite a big change. I'm not sure if I mentioned that, but like for cash flow, for example, even though the margins are better because we buy neutral grain spirit and that makes up 50% of the liquid volume we sell. Um, but it does mean our cash flow is very different, which is a conversation you have to have with the accountants and business managers. Um, but what we will likely probably end up doing is the menu will change once a year, probably in February or March, um, where we will spend 12 months building up spring, summer, and autumn produce, and, and to a smaller extent, winter produce then release a menu built on that stockpile, and then recreate the process again and again. Um, this menu we have coming out in May will be the first menu that we will not have completely changed the concept from one menu to another. Uh, it will be more of an evolution of this. We have three menu changes planned in the next few years, um, kind of further exploring this idea. Yeah? When you open from day one, that would remain a year of the place, or you come to it, right? No. When Little Red Door opened nearly 10 years ago, um, it was when Paris was just starting to have speakeasy cocktail bars and all of those kind of things that I think most cocktail cultures go through, right? Um, the area Little Red Door is in is in Le Marais, which is very well known for the art galleries and boutiques in the area. So Little Red Door was kind of a space that showed art, had live music, actually did food at one point. Um, now it is very specialized in what we've done, but that's mainly because of the feedback. Year on year, we got more and more feedback for the cocktail program, for what we were offering, was unique in that way. But like I said, I think the only thing that's really stayed across those 10 years is this approach to hospitality that is, isn't anti-Parisian, because Parisians aren't mean. They're just different in the way they approach hospitality. And we are very international in that way. We are very over, over the top friendly. And so that's probably the only thing that stayed across it. Um, and like I said, this wasn't what this is now wasn't even the way we were planning it two years ago when we first started. It's just kind of sprawling out of control. And yeah, we're just holding on as it runs away from us. <laughs>